Maar vandaag uh, Jillis en Jurre. Uh, die gaan een praatje houden over hardware uh, hacken. Uh, het is voor beginners, dus ook al heb je geen ervaring, uh, ja, dan mag je meedoen. Uh, na die tijd, uh, je gaat eerst een theoretisch verhaaltje houden en daarna gaan we CTF uh, houden. Ja. En dat is ook al web-based. Dus ja, de, de uh, mensen die uh, dit later op de stream kijken, kunnen dan uh, alsnog uh, ja, op die manier meedoen. Uh, ze kunnen dan helaas geen sport doen, dus je moet dan wel zelf uh, uh, zien te doen. Het is, uh, de CTF staat alleen voor dus ah, niet okay. uh, later. Dus alleen uh, vandaag en morgen. Ja. Oké. Okay. Uh, maar dan geef ik uh, jullie de vloer. Dus uh, doe je verhaal. All right, welcome everybody. Um, we are Jure and Jelle, and we're gonna talk about our hacking hardware hacking workshop. Take it away. Yeah. Uh, so the reason we switched to English is to allow uh, international people uh, to join this stream as well. Um, so yeah, Jure and uh, Jillis. Uh, we're still connected, or? Ah. Long live technology. Not normal, but in Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> heb, je, heb je de problemen mee dat we hem in het Engels doen? Heb je liever dat we hem in het Nederlands doen? Oké, okay, oké. Okay. Ja, oké. Okay. Zeg maar, we zijn primair hier natuurlijk voor jullie, maar omdat het ook gestreamd wordt. Nee, hey, uh. Ja, kom. Oké. Okay. Hallo, mijn naam is uh, Jelles Groenendijk. Dit is Jure uh, Groenendijk. Uh, we are on uh, Twitter, uh, Jelles underscore com. Uh, we don't mind uh, you taking pictures, so feel free to do so, share Welcome social media. Tag yeah, that's, that's good. Um, I tend to spend other people's money by sharing stuff online on Twitter. Uh, slash mail is something that I got from uh, usually AliExpress or Amazon. Stuff that I buy like uh, special devices, stuff to clone, uh, uh, access cards, uh, whatever. Uh, the stuff that we will show you will allow you to hack stuff, be responsible. Uh, there's 138 AB and there's 250 AB. You might want to uh, research that, that's a law uh, that uh, 
tells you that if you do not have written uh, consent, uh, you will have to uh, spend four years in jail, 20,500 euros fine. So careful with that. Uh, to have an idea of the people that are in this room, uh, who of you codes, as in uh, uh, creates programs, a uh, uh, little bit, yeah, okay. So, uh, who of you uh, does like CTFs, uh, uh, hacking um, challenges? Some of you. Uh, and who of you create stuff like Arduino, Raspberry Pi, Demotics? Okay, cool. So uh, we have a little challenge for you. Uh, so these are ports on hardware, and can you identify uh, what you see? Just yell it. So what kind of port do you see right now? USB. Okay. Next one. Whoa. That is really good. XLR. Nice. This one. Uh, this port, uh, this connection, this cable, so... So this cable or connection is called Grove. And Grove is a way to simply connect different devices. Uh, so there's four cables. There's a black cable for ground. There's a red cable for uh, like power. And there's a uh, yellow and a white cable. And the yellow and white cable can be variable. So it can either be UART, like serial communication, can be uh, I squared C, also serial communication, and can be a GPIO, like for reading sensors or driving motors of, or whatever. Grove. Uh, this ecosystem is called M5 Stack, and um, it is, and uh, I stole this from you, the love baby between Lego and Arduino. So if you have a Lego, uh, it will uh, become uh, very expensive. So it's like 400 euros, and if you have an Arduino, it's uh, kind of cheap. However, if you misconfigure the uh, connections, uh, you will have a short circuit and either break down your laptop or your device or both. Uh, this uh, is a simple plug and play uh, connection. Uh, it's called M5 because the dimensions are five by five centimeters and you can stack the components. So there's like a CPU based on ESP32 and there's like different modules. So you have a module for GSM, you have a module for LoRaWAN, you have a module for Zigbee, uh, you have a module for radio frequency. So you can do all kinds of cool stuff and it is fairly cheap. So m5stack.com, and uh, they sell it worldwide now. So when they started, uh, it was like mainly aimed at children and education, uh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, but now they also have like PLC and like rail mounted uh, uh, connections, uh, uh, like addressing uh, 3D printers. So uh, cool one to look into. This one. Jack for power, yeah. This one. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> break it, you buy it. Uh, this is indeed JTAG. Uh, this one. Could be USB, it's just for uh, four pins. Uh, no, it's not SPI, uh, if, if uh, SPI has more pins. Uh, UART. This one. It's like a headphone jack. What is it used for? Audio. Yeah, it could be audio, could be video, like uh, the, the early Raspberry Pi had a video connector that had like composite video on it. No, also UART. So you see that UART, which is like, if you ever worked with network equipment, like the Cisco stuff, you have to, like the light blue cable that uh, would uh, allow you elevated access into the, the device. Uh, 
whenever you start a computer, you see like all kind of letters before uh, you uh, actually see the uh, uh, the windows pop up. Uh, that is like the the uh, uh, bootloader of the system, and that is uh, information that you will see if you connect to a, a UART uh, uh, connection. This one, and this is an Xbox 360 keyboard. It is a DIN connector and it runs MIDI, yeah, both right. This one. This is, by the way, the badge for MCH. Sorry? Of course, we're running Doom, yeah, because everything should ru run Doom. This is a shitty add-on connector, uh, which is a method of allowing people to beautify your batches. So there's batches here. And uh, if you look here, wrong example. If you look here, like the, the, the purple one is the batch. And on the side, there's a connector that will allow like the um, a Nixie tube uh, being connected. So people can make additions to a batch for running them. So this also uh, uh, has like the possibility to add sensors to your uh, network or uh, to uh, read data from, uh, from the device. This one, it's a hard disk. SATA, SATA and power, correct? Which one is the power? No, it's the other way around. So the, the power is the, the white one and uh, the uh, serial connection. So SATA is serial ATA, just as you had PATA, which was called IDE. Um, and this one. Sorry? No, it's not, uh, not hard, you mean? Sorry? No, it's not power supply? Uh, that's this one, this power supply? Sorry, JTEC? No, it's not JTEC. No. And uh, some people uh, um, thought, well, like, uh, back in the IDE uh, days, we had, like, the uh, primary master, uh, uh, primary secondary... Uh, that's not the case. This is also UART. So you can connect to a hard disk. Uh, please don't do this on the hard disks with valuable data, as when you connect with the incorrect baud rate, you will break it. So it will become the most valuable <laughs> paperweight that you ever created. Uh, but it uh, will allow you to like uh, mark sectors, like do fancy stuff to, uh, to the hard disk. This one, and it has two connectors, so uh, five volt ground, data in, and on the other side it's five volt ground and data out. It just has like one wire for uh, uh, yeah connecting everything together. What is the name of this protocol? Yeah, it's one wire protocol. <laughs> It is indeed one wire, and uh, most of the, the uh, addressable LEDs, like the NeoPixels, work like uh, like this. So what you do is, like, you have an array. If you uh, send red to it, like, the first LED will become red. If you send red, uh, blue, the uh, first one will become blue, and the second one will become red. This one. Vegia. Uh, so uh, a VGA uh, is a 15-pin connector, so it has like three lines. Uh, back in the days, when I was a little boy, uh, we had EGA and CGA, which used this connector. Uh, but this is uh, serial, so uh, DB9, uh, uh, sorry, RS232. Uh, and RS232 is a uh, serial protocol, just as you are, just as I2C. Th they all work a little different. I will zoom in. I'm talking about a lot of different abbreviations, but this is like uh, half a baseline. I will uh, 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 show how things work later on. Uh, 
This uses different voltages. So like most of the equipment uh, that you see nowadays, that uses UART, and UART is like ground and 303 volt, or ground and 5 volt. This uses minus 12, or minus 18, plus 18. So if you connect these connections to that device, uh, it's an early uh, <laughs> uh, New Year's Eve. <laughs> this one. Yeah, so uh, what does it stand for? Onboard Diagnostics. So this is a connector uh, that has like different um, CAN bus, which is also a serial protocol, uh, uh, embedded to allow cars to communicate uh, with their uh, sensors, with their windshield wipers, with their brakes, with their steering wheel, with their blinking lights. So, um, it used to be the case that you pressed a button and like energy would flow to the light and go back to the, the AQ and then light, that's no longer the case. So, your car is full of, most of your cars, are full of uh, computers, uh, ECUs, and uh, they uh, are driven by these CAN buses. And there are three CAN buses in a, in a car that will allow you to do uh, specific things. Um, so if you open a door, uh, you will see a time mark, you will see a uh, ID and you will see a certain message. There is a CTF challenge on the, the uh, CAN bus, by the way. Um, and if you close it, you will see something similar. If you turn on your windshield wiper, a message is broadcast to the ca CAN bus to make sure that your windshield wipers uh, stay in motion. So if you monitor uh, that ca CAN bus, you will find that uh, it is just sending that uh, one specific message. So if you turn off the, uh, the button, you won't see it anymore. However, if you have a computer and you can send such a message to the car, you will be able to uh, uh, start your windshield wiper. And uh, during Corona, we uh, did some streaming and someone in the UK, uh, Ian Tabor, uh, the allowed us to hack his car remotely. So from our house, we connected via Raspberry Pi to a VPN in his house, controlling his Peugeot car and like uh, had the uh, 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 all the alarm uh, lights blinking, uh, had like the entire uh, uh, dashboard was like blinking like a, a Christmas tree just by sending different messages to, to the car. So if you know how this works, uh, you can have an advantage there. Be careful, however, because the ignition of the uh, uh, airbag is also connected to there. And there I was a person at Nulcon that did a fuzzing on the bus uh, with his laptop on uh, the steering wheel. <laughs> and uh, uh, he survived, but it was uh, a challenging uh, situation. Uh, his laptop didn't, and uh, I think he lost a few teeth as well. <laughs> so, uh, ca careful. I say in general, when working around with cars, yeah. uh, especially if they're turned on, be careful with them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it's three uh, CAN buses. They are uh, for uh, different um, uh, purposes. So one is like for the entertainment system. One is like uh, generically for uh, um, uh, uh, lights, and the other one is uh, like for uh, the, the the danger stuff. Uh, uh, the the uh, um, yeah. So uh, y if you open the car like under the hood, yeah. Sorry? Um, 
I suspect you uh, uh, would, yeah. So uh, still on my wish list, and I have more projects in mind than days to live, uh, is uh, buying a car, <laughs> uh, stripping it completely, and building it to a suitcase or a box or whatever to do uh, and show how, how this works by actually measuring all the, the, uh, the information. I already had the contact with a garage that uh, would sell me like a Volkswagen for 500 euros. So, uh, yeah, things to come. <laughs> Siri, wire money to... Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> what's this uh, connection? So this is an SD card. But what protocol would you uh, expect this to run? They have three protocols, but... SPI, yeah. So you can just solder wires to an SD card and uh, read the data from a device. This one, so this is a router and Ethernet. And the cool thing is like you see a light green uh, surface and also dark green. So the dark green are non-conductive while the light green are uh, conductive. So you see this entire uh, connector uh, is dark green, so it is shielded from the rest of the uh, circuit. So uh, there's uh, either optocouplers or uh, there's uh, like a magnetic uh, uh, shielding between those two to prevent 48 volt running over the 5 volt of the, of the device. Ethernet. So who are we? Uh, I'm Jillis and uh, I'm from 1969. So uh, way back, and my granddad used to like save stuff, uh, like boxes with uh, those uh, special uh, bulbs instead of transistors and like old stuff. So uh, he let me play in his shed with all his uh, uh, stuff and I was not as afraid as uh, of uh, technology as m most of my schoolmates were because like yeah i just saw what happened and like what happened if you smash it with a hammer and like uh, uh, tear st stuff apart and then when i got older i went to, to the flea market and obtained those crt uh, screens took them apart like uh, uh, create I'm diagnosed uh, autistic. Uh, uh, put everything in like boxes with all the components and like number them and like, uh, yeah, I'm really happy with all the boxes. And then uh, there was the Electure, which was a, uh, a magazine at that time that would allow you, especially in the summer, with a lot of different uh, circuits that they had to create your own piano or create your own alarm system or create your own telephone. So by taking a television apart, I was able to make a piano. So it was like really cool. Uh, my first language was assembly. I used the Philips VideoPak uh, G7000 and it had a, uh, an assembly module with 99 steps. Uh, and like the most advanced thing that it could do was like display my name in different colors while beeping. Uh, one of the first events, like we have MCH now, was uh, the Galactic Hacker Party, GHP, uh, which was held at Paradiso in Amsterdam. And uh, uh, I was there, I have pictures to prove it. And uh, at that time, there was no law and legislation, no wet telecommunicatie. So uh, I admitted it uh, in front of police, Openbaar Ministerie, and it was uh, verjaard. So uh, <laughs> at that time, we could like make free phone calls by using uh, special boxes. So this is like a simple box. So you have blue box, yellow box, uh, silver box, etc. But I used to work at Dixons at that time and we had Profone's Antwoord Apparaten, which is like a device that allows you uh, to store your message on a cassette tape and like listen it back, like we have voicemail now. And they had a, a device to be able to listen uh, into your messages from abroad. And uh, uh, most of them had like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero star and uh, hash or pound. But this one also had like A, B, C, D. 
And if you had a telephone with a red display where you could see the coin dropping, <laughs> uh, stuff could happen. Uh, I work for Deloitte uh, since 2015. Uh, I started uh, running and maintaining a um, SOC, we call it KIC, Cyber Intelligence Center, a security monitoring environment, so it's like a uh, room with a lot of screens, with a lot of data about customers, about their health status, and it uh, monitors like stuff. If I come into a building, show my card, it is okay in Den Haag. If I do the same thing in Amsterdam, it's also okay, but it's not okay if I do it within the same minute. So it uh, looks at correlation between uh, different events, lo looks at uh, all kind of storage, on uh, all kind of monitoring stuff on uh, sensors, on devices, on systems. <coughs> uh, and I started to bring stuff from home, like uh, how about we tear this camera system apart in the evening? Who's going to order pizza? So that's how it started. And then we had like this uh, client that would like to uh, assess a, a hardware device. Uh, we did it and uh, we had three different shells on that uh, specific device. And the client was flabbergasted. And that resulted in uh, to having uh, this client still and supplying us with more uh, devices over and over and turned into a business. So from that time on, not only was I like working on monitoring systems, but also other things. So this is basically what I do, fun stuff. Uh, I take hardware apart, I monitor stuff, uh, I break into hardware, I break into buildings, uh, and I assist uh, the uh, people of the red team. So uh, like there's uh, a blue team and a red team. The blue team is monitoring everything. So if something goes wrong, the blue team will get a message and will have to act upon that. But how do you know that your blue team is actually working as they should? There's also like a red team, like the mystery guest in the shop that drops by, tries to break in, and it should be noticed somehow. So usually a different company that does that. So uh, this is Mission Impossible stuff. People with gadgets, people with special watches, people that install things under the, th the table. And uh, the last two years I built crazy gadgets for them. So building stuff that uh, taps into cables that uh, uh, is able to clone a cart in uh, an elevator, uh, whatever. Um, I think you cannot do this work if you're not passionate about it. So you should be embracing this with all your heart. And uh, when I'm not in hackerspaces talking about uh, hardware, I'm dressed up as a unicorn with rainbow hair in uh, Comic-Con. So people tend to wear those glasses, which are, uh, have Bluetooth, that show all kinds of animations. When you are in my vicinity, it will show my messages, because this is unauthenticated. So your app sends data to this uh, device, and there's no password. So if I send something to this, this device just using Bluetooth, I'm able to show whatever text I want, as long as I'm close to you. Uh, if you've seen Stranger Things, and yes, we have just two more weeks to go for the final season, uh, you uh, are aware of this uh, sign, which is uh, Joyce's w uh, wall, where she communicates with her kid that was lost in the upside down world. Uh, and I was like, sorry? Uh, spoiler alert if you haven't watched it, but like you're way too long, uh, too late now. I think uh, they already t took it off uh, Netflix now. Uh, so I saw someone walking around with this board like a carton board, like Christmas lights with everything. So I went to this lady, dressed up as 11. Is this interactive? I'm sorry? 
is this interactive? I have no clue what words you say to me. Okay, thanks. Went home, bought an ESP32, uh, 8266 for two euros, a LED string for eight euros, and I made this. So I can connect using my phone to the board and show whatever message that you want. So like an Ouija board. So it's like, tick, 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 tick. oh, sorry. <coughs> Uh, and like shows like B, R, O, O, whatever. So um, I'm also a member of Tool, the open organization of lock pickers. So I like to assess physical devices, also locks. I used to like create my own vaults in Lego, autistic. Um, so opening locks is like similar to um, breaking hardware uh, things. It's like a puzzle, it's like an escape room, it's like something that you have to do to bypass the security measures. So people think that people that uh, uh, are a member of Tool uh, are people that break into buildings. There's three rules that you have to apply to. So you do not pick something that is in use. So if this door is locked and it is in use because we need to go out, I'm not going to lockpick it because we have to go out of the window if I break my gear into the lock. Uh, I will only do it on stuff that is mine and not in use. And if I do it for someone else, I need written consent. So those are the three rules uh, that will not allow you to break into your neighbor's garage even if you're uh, DHL. Uh, so for um, tool for the presentation, uh, I use to like leech. Like I see all these experts that have like 20 years plus experience on lock picking and I just use it as a fidget tool during a meeting to try and see if I can open like a really, really, really simple one. So I thought, well, what can I contribute to this meeting with all these experts? How about I join hardware hacking and lockpicking? So I don't know if you've seen War Games with Matthew Roderick being locked down and used like a memo recorder to replay all the beeps to open up the door. Would it be possible to replay something to open up a door? So we had a smart lock at the office. Would it be possible to drill a hole on the outside? Like the computer of the lock is on the inside, so I can't reach the computer. And take the wire out. So I did, drill the hole, did not touch any electronics, took the wire out. Red, black, yellow. Red, PC, black, ground, and just one wire. We had one wire. I know one wire. Okay. Let's create an Arduino that is able to decode whatever I do. So I connected like an Arduino, press one, beep, 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 beep. Ah, I can record all the beep, 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 beeps. So it's like a number of ones and zeros. I recorded it, did it for two, did it for three. And then I noticed if I typed in a correct code, that same one wire addressed a LED on the outside saying green. It's good. Red, it's incorrect. Feedback, I love it. So I created this thing and I was able to brute force the lock and open the lock from the outside by drilling a hole, using a paper clip, taking the cable out, just hooking on uh, to some pins and being able to yeah, like brute force it. So uh, in total, uh, this entire attack will take uh, over three hours to do them all, but people are lazy. So they use one, three, nine, seven, or one, three, three, seven, or like uh, their uh, birth year or their zip code. So if you take that in mind and create like an optimized list, you will be way faster doing this. Uh, I'm a dad as well. I have identical twins. This is one of them. The other one looks almost similar. Uh, and they both play D&D, &D, 
and I take chips off. So this is, it was like a mother, uh, mother day's, uh, uh, Mother's Day gift. So we made like a CTF for her. She had to like solve all kinds of riddles and challenges to be able to find all the jigsaw puzzle that in the end lead to this wonderful picture. All right. So <laughs> I am uh, Jure Grunendijk. I am a 20-year-old uh, computer science and engineering student, also currently an, uh, an employee at Deloitte as well. Um, and yeah, I'm 20, so my journey is only just beginning. No. <laughs> so, when I was about six or seven, um, my dad um, had this box called a computer slope kit, a computer destroy box, that I would use, uh, that he would put like these, uh, yeah, these devices, hard drives, uh, computer components, uh, anything that was safe to do it, no, no lithium ion batteries. Um, and little, little old me would just take a hammer and go bonk and see what it does. And just try to take it apart. And, you know, as, as I grew older, the hammer got replaced by a screwdriver and a soldering iron. And um, eventually, this, this piqued my interest uh, a lot in, um, in hardware and just electronics in general. Now, I, um, I am gifted. Um, which also means that I was done at school very quickly, which means that uh, when my dad went to school at some point, uh, he saw me reading Donald Duck in the attic. Um, that's not the best thing to do at school, but the teachers could not uh, offer me any more, any more challenge. I was done with all the assignments for the day after hour two, and I had nothing else to do, so I went to go read Donald Duck. He didn't like that. So um, he went on to uh, one day in a week, stand in front of the class, and did a plus class, an additional cloth where he, uh, where he, um, yeah, where he challenged us, uh, uh, me and other other kids that needed extra stimulation, uh, where we did all kinds of cool stuff. So we took a uh, a phone screen apart, created our own font for this. Um, we made a box mostly using I Square C devices, where you could basically log into and do whatever you want. So this is a, a Raspberry Pi button box because it has a Raspberry Pi in it and it has a lot of buttons, um, and you can log into this and program it to do anything you want. If you enter a two euro coin, it will create you a nice poem. So you can do a lot of things with it. We also did some, uh, some other stuff. So it's uh, this slide, uh, let's see which one is it here. Um, my dad took, uh, took apart a sign that you would see at a bus station, uh, use the creme brulee brander to torch off the uh, chip and then soldered an Arduino uh, onto it, which we also, uh, made big drawings for that we would manually convert from boxes to binary to eventually uh, program onto that. So um, I got a lot of uh, simulation that way and I, that's big my interest, which is also where I learned my first programming language being quite basic uh, at a relatively young age. Um, and from there on, I just got more and more interested in technology. Uh, I started attending these, uh, these conventions, these congresses, so We've got my local hacker space, that's where it all started, but then also uh, soon grew to uh, SHA, Hacker Hotel, the Chaos Computer Congress, all these big camps, um, where I learned a lot of super cool things. And uh, eventually I started thinking, well, why don't I also contribute? So um, also from a very young age, I think it started at 12 or 13, I started also giving lectures, just like this one, um, all around the world. I think actually last year, I, did, I or two years ago, I did one in Sydney um, via computer because of COVID, uh, which is very, very cool to do, talking to these kids all over the world. It was for um, uh, Hack Week Kids, I think. Yeah. And uh, however cool it was, it was in Sydney, so I had to wake up at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, uh, there's some good points about it. There's some bad points about it. But um, yeah. Uh, furthermore, I have also hacked my school at uh, age 14, um, and uh, a documentary was made about that. I've done a bunch of cool stuff, got into the camera system, got into the uh, locker systems, copying passes. Um, the documentary can be found if you uh, search for Jure Hack on uh, YouTube. Um, I would show it, but we, sure. it's, it's about a five minute documentary, yeah. not, nothing too big, but I would show it, but unfortunately we do not have audio. Uh, on stream. On stream, yes. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, yeah, if you want, uh, and it's interesting, you can uh, look it up yourself. Um, I think there's more kids that hacked their school. Uh, they uh, made it to the news, even. 
uh, but what is different uh, with you hacking uh, the uh, school and those other people? A pretty, uh, a pretty good distinction to be made. So um, in my story, yeah, we're not showing it, so I might as well do the story itself. Um, I went to the principal and I said, Munir, <laughs> can I hack your school? Uh, what? <laughs> um, interestingly, he said yes. But um, I made some... Written uh, consent. Uh, yeah. Written consent, uh, responsible disclosure deals. I'm not allowed to talk to it, uh, uh, talk about it to anyone with, before it's fixed. I'm not allowed to use it. I'm not allowed to impact uh, infrastructure. And um, yeah, I did it the legal way. So of course you can you can read about a random kid who paid for a stressor to deal with a school website. Um, I'm not like that. So this is, uh, yeah, this is more of a story of a somebody who did it in a legal way at a at a pretty young age. Yeah, so. and I, I think what led to that was um, uh, in the Netherlands, there's this InfoSec community where people meet up and uh, collaborate on whatever threat we have. Like there uh, was one moment in time where everyone had like these red displays on their screen and have to pay like bit uh, uh, coins to be able to work again. Uh, there was a thing with uh, Maersk, uh, which Deloitte actually helped with. I can name the client because it was in uh, Darknet Diaries. Um, so we uh, solve stuff, but sometimes uh, the issues are too large for uh, just one company. And we need to like collaborate with everyone that I used to be like our competitor. So um, people connect. Uh, I, th I think it was Ronald Prince from Fox IT at that time that created the uh, the idea to call these meetings whiskey leaks, as in WikiLeaks, uh, but like people were would drink whiskey at that time and uh, hang out. But then people joining those meetings became younger and younger, uh, like. Uh, uh, Rick van Gelen was, uh, I think, the first one, and then uh, Jure as well. So uh, we started bringing Fristy. So <laughs> they are called uh, either Whiskey Leaks, depending on the audience, or Fristy Leaks nowadays. And uh, that's like uh, people from uh, a governmental and uh, with a governmental background, or that works for like the agencies. Or uh, it is not cool to say, well. Uh, I'm going to uh, DDoS uh, like uh, the Helle, Hellevoetsluis municipality, uh, gemeente, uh, 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 because I think that's cool. Uh, you will be corrected instantly, like with whatever someone finds on the table. Uh, <laughs> so that leads to the consciousness of uh, taking uh, the law in account and using this in, uh, in such a way that it really helps school. And uh, we did a presentation at DEX, uh, which is the uh, yeah an inspiring session for uh, police, defense, uh, like all, all kind of different uh, uh, forces uh, working together. And Jure was awarded by uh, the General Prosecutor's Office for his work that he did to inspire kids and elderly in uh, uh, Code Dojo's libraries and whatever since he was 11, I think. So if you look at, so w there was like a, p a piece about us. Uh, if you look at hardware, it is like really hard uh, to fix that. And you will see that if you open up hardware, especially like cheaper hardware, it feels like there's a draadje uit de brievenbus uh, that would open the door. Uh, or like uh, playing with a Rubik's Cube or listening uh, to uh, uh, Samantha Fox. Um, it feels like nobody ever looked at it. Uh, but it's hard to uh, do uh, hardware security right because it is about first to market so you create a new device but your competitor is also creating that same new device who actually gets the uh, amount of users uh, to make that actually work uh, so what's the battery life 
uh, I can have like this super cool device that's super secure and post quantum crypto implementations, but I can only use it for an hour. And it's used to track my dog and I have to recharge it every time or my dog is like not able to move because the battery is too heavy. It probably isn't be being used. So it is cost, it is updates, it is battery life. There's like a lot of things that uh, uh, you will find. So people tend to take shortcuts, like create their own crypto implementation. And crypto always create your own crypto, especially <laughs> if you have a lot of hacker friends. Um, no, that's... There are some things that uh, you really have to take in mind, especially now when uh, hardware is getting cheaper or like if you have a router, uh, your ISP will say, hey, we just upgraded to fast something. Where, uh, uh, so you get a new router that allows you to have like gigabit. So what do I do, I do with the old one? Just throw it away. No. <laughs> So I'm tearing it apart, looking at stuff, find like uh, keys, find like passwords. Maybe another ISP is still using it. So by being able to tear one down, I will be able to hack some, uh, some other device. And like, especially if you have a device that is being mass produced, where it is using proper crypto, but like all the keys are the same because it's like, uh, uh, create a mass, then hacking one is hacking all. So if there's like a uh, nuclear power plant that uses a, a certain fan, uh, brand PLC, and I have seen that on Shodan, Shodan is like the search engine that allows you to search for power plants and hard monitors and uh, other uh, dangerous stuff. Um, I can go to eBay and buy such a PLC to see if there's like vulnerabilities and then I can uh, attack uh, that specific brand, that specific version of hardware. And usually hacking a power plant is not that easy, so that's why I use that example. But like a, a lot of stuff is using MD5 hashing, there's no shadow file, there's uh just one binary uh, using stuff the, the entire security uh relies on a sticker if you uh void this sticker your uh, if you break the sticker your uh warranty is void so that's why i made the sticker i void warranties for a living so i, I already mentioned showdown showdown uh, is uh, something like if you have Google or Bing or whatever, uh, it searches for a specific port, so like port 80 and port 443, and allows you to search for web pages. So um, it allows you to search for anything that's in the text, and you can also add like specific tags for um, metadata, like this describes the page, or the, this is the author, or this is the version, or uh, whatever. Uh, Shodan works differently. They look at ports that you usually only uh, would see in a local LAN that would show precious information, that would show a login screen of your Windows domain administrator machine, or that would show a refueling uh, control panel to uh, do whatever by not looking at port 80, but also like uh, at all kind of different ports. And um, some of them are real devices, some of them are decoys, honeypots. So you would see that people create a device that says, well, hey, I'm a heart monitor. I'm actually a Raspberry Pi, but I'm a heart monitor, hack me. My uh, uh, username and password is admin admin, so let me see how you hack me, because I want to see how the hackers uh, hack uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, but there, there is, uh, in fact, 
uh, yeah, real devices. And you see people saving on two-factor authentication. You have those uh, hard tokens that have like a window with a specific code that uh, uh, replays. You have like, uh, but these are like 50 euros. So if you're like a really small company and want to save on money, then you uh, take like a cheap webcam, point at the two-factor uh, uh, screen, <laughs> And uh, people can log into uh, that uh, uh, screen sharing option and have like a two factor for the entire company. It happened. So, uh, yeah. Uh, there's some examples of uh, uh, hardware hacks. Uh, there uh, is this Swedish guy called PewDiePie. Uh, and he has a YouTube channel and does like crazy things. And there's like another, is it company? Yeah, a company called T Series. Yeah, yeah, you do the story. There's a YouTuber called PewDiePie, my mom might have heard of him. And there's this a uh, company called uh, T Series. And PewDiePie was the most subscribed YouTuber in the world for three, four years, something like that. The, the longest time. Um, but then this other company called uh, this, this Indian company called T Series, which just uploads Hollywood clips or whatever, uh, started rising up in subscriber count, um, probably through malicious means, but there's no no confirmation on that. And um, yeah, there was like this big battle between uh, between PewDiePie and T Series, and there's like this whole whole thing on the internet. Everybody go subscribe to PewDiePie, make sure that he beats T Series. Um, and there's this one guy. He thought, how can I get the attention of the masses to get people to subscribe to PewDiePie? That, 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 that was one thing. <laughs> that, that was one thing that he had in mind. And at the same time, he noticed that there was this port, 9100, that allowed you to uh, <laughs> <laughs> send print messages. Uh, so, what if... <laughs> I responsibly sent out a message to the world to fix this, and while doing that... Also send them a message about subscribing to T-Series. Unsubscribing. Unsubscribing to T-Series. So, like, they got the people... More, yeah. Unsubscribe to T-Series, subscribe to Budapai, <laughs> yeah. This was one of his stories. The other one, he did the same thing with Google Chromecast. So if you want to hear more about this story, subscribe to Darknet Diaries, it's an English uh, uh, podcast, and shows a lot about hardware hackers, red teams, like really, really funny stuff. Uh, there was a two hotel blocks in Finland that were uh, DDoS and uh, their heating system uh, uh, was knocked out, so people were in the cold. Uh, there was the Mirai botnet, uh, so what you usually see is people get an email, uh, you won a bold.com uh, voucher. Please cl uh, click here and install this uh, uh, or watch this uh, video.mpg.exe uh, and we'll install like malicious software on your machine to be able to have it as a dormant soldier in a bot network that will attack different uh, devices by a command and control server. So command and control server is like one central machine that is telling uh, thousands, millions of computers to attack a, a specific uh, company, industry uh, 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 system. But in this case, actually hardware was hacked. So routers, uh, camera systems, uh, uh, cameras themselves, were hacked to be able uh, to uh, have like a botnet uh, uh, to be mobilized to attack uh, uh, others. And I recall that there was a dip in the DNS worldwide, uh, I think for one minute to illustrate how powerful it, uh, it was. Uh, baby monitors. 
I actually had that happen to me as well. I bought a pen tail zoom camera from, I think it was Aldi, it was $29.95, like really, really cheap. Uh, and it uh, connected uh, via UPnP directly to the internet. So I'm here, connect to me, admin admin. Uh, and this camera uh, was able to have like audio feedback. So it could like record audio from people that were in the room, but uh, someone like a remote could also send a message. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> this is mama. <laughs> no, no, don't do that. Uh, and I actually had people talking to me, I think it was Spanish. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, people will connect to, uh, to those. I think there's even a website that monitors all the open cameras that you can, uh, can connect to. Uh, this one was uh, created by uh, one of my uh, fluffy friends, uh, Andrew Cherney from Pentest Partners in the UK also known on Twitter as Cyber Gibbons. And uh, he did a research with his company on uh, chastities, so kuisheidsgordel. So this is something where the male genital, uh, genitals are <laughs> being secured in <laughs> uh, for someone else to uh, release it or not. However, they could brick it, allowing uh, <laughs> only to be opened with a uh, angled grinder <laughs> kind of hard, like the, the stuff that we have downstairs. Uh, yeah, they call the fire department, they will have fun <laughs> and they will make pictures. Uh, so careful with this, uh, uh, this stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This concludes my TED talk. Um, hardware security is a thing. So, uh, 1.5 billion uh, attacks for six months, 2021. And there will be more. So, if you look at security, hardware security, it is not like it has like the lock in the screen, so now it must be secure. So we told everyone like, if you have a web page and does not have a lock, you're unsafe. So we need to have like a lock in the page that uh, says like HTTPS, so we're secure now. And now you see like all the uh, people creating malware use Let's Encrypt to create a lock and everyone trusts this and everyone like uh, sends their, their data. Hardware security, especially uh, if you care about privacy, uh, if you uh, care about AVG, about uh, uh, GDPR, uh, need to be something uh, that you build into your entire ecosystem. So you cannot leak what you do not have. So why do I want to store that I am mail for using a router why uh, why do i have to store my address for uh, 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 something so uh, you need to look at like what do i store how do i store it is it like encrypted address so if i take the chip off am i able to read like the contents or is it encrypted in transit? If I send it from one component to another component, will it still be readable? Can I like eavesdrop on the uh, communication? Like this should be in, in mind. And I think uh, Dave can come up with 60, uh, 600,000 reasons why it's good to care about <laughs> uh, privacy. Um, so if you look at hardware hacking, these are like my uh, steps to take. So uh, it's like UART. UART is like the console mode of a device. So you will see like devices booting and say, uh, I'm this device and this, this version number. And uh, uh, this is the email address from the person that took it from this Git library. And this is my public key. And this is my private key. And this is my part. Uh, uh, no, that's not. Uh, <laughs> so you see more information than you should. 
And depending on how they configured it, you will see everything. You will see nothing. You will see something uh, in between. So this will be my fir uh, to go to, the UART uh, port. Uh, second thing is the, these devices um, roll off a band and need to be provisioned with the hardware. So they use JTAG. Uh, JTAG is a protocol made uh, by a group of people it's called the Joint Test Action Group, and I think Philips was one of them. And uh, JTAG allows you to provision the hardware, like to program the chip, to install the software on the chip. But it also allows you to see if there's any short circuits between like GPIO pins. And it al also allows you to uh, find the different components in a chain. So how JTAG works, it's like you have one device, your CPU, and there's like memory connected, and there's like Bluetooth connector uh, connected to, to it. And like you can hop from one uh, device to another. So this device will allow me to install the software on the device, but it will also allow me to retrieve the software from the device. And retrieving it is, it is a little bit complex. You need to know where to start, but usually that's a giveaway from the UART uh, port already. Um, and you will be able like, to save to a file, and then you have like the binary data, and you can run through the binary data with Linux tools, just like binwalk or strings or farmost or scalpel or whatever to find whatever crown jewels are in this documentation or in this compiled source. Or you can like run it uh, through uh, Ghidra and like decode all the assembly uh, messages. This can be prevented by setting fuse bits. Not with everything, but like most modern devices will have fuse bits, like a fuse in your uh, uh, Metacast. Forgot the name. Um, however, these are no. Sorry? In your fuse box, thank you. Um, so. Um, these are not real fuses, it is just a bit that is being set that will not allow you to read uh, the data. However, there are things called side channel uh, attacks that we continue later. Uh, <laughs> that will allow you to bypass the settings. And uh, one of the persons that has some experience with that is uh, Ghidra RA stack smashing on Twitter, uh, Thomas Roth from Germany, and he hacked the Nintendo Game & Watch to uh, run it not only the game that it was provisioned initially, but allow you to like install other uh, Nintendo games on it. Uh, and he hacked the AirTag from Apple. Uh, by uh, glitching it and uh, inducing a fault into the system that would yeah, confuse the security. Uh, all these components are connected in a way. So you have uh, like your microcontroller, like your Lego brick, and you have a motor. And the motor needs to connect with the, uh, the Lego brick. So microcontroller sensor. <coughs> Take a sip of water. You can intercept the communication between the motor and the microcontroller. So between the motor and the microcontroller, it's just sending out power that makes a uh, wheel spin. It's not that interesting. But what if you have an encryption chip that will create encryption in transit or create encryption on in rest? Where is the password stored? Not in that chip itself. So there's a special chip that has the password. Is that password also encrypted or is that password in plain text? This password is in plain text. So if I read the communication between the EEPROM that stores the password in plain text and the encryption chip, then I'm able to decode all the, uh, the data. If this plain text password is the same for all the devices, 
I'm able to read all the encrypted text that's properly encrypted by inter uh, by eavesdropping um, the communication. Uh, sometimes I'm fed up with it and I'm just lazy, and then I take one of those fancy hair dryers and uh, use some flux on the sides, heat it up, take the chip off, put the chip like in a socket, and uh, I'm able to just dump the data by using a four euro device. Uh, the glitching part. Devices uh, work on the specific circumstances. So my circumstance is like I really like it cold. So this is not my ideal circumstance, so I leak water the entire time. That's why I'm like running around with a towel while it's not towel day. Um, these chips only work like in a specific range of voltage, like from a 1.815 volt to 3.378 volt. So what happens if I undervolt it? It stops or it works, but not the security. Uh, you play with these things. So heat it, cool it, overvolt it, undervolt it, add magnetism, add uh, electromagnetic pulses, add light to it, do whatever you can to confuse it. And there's a, a manual that comes with all these components called the datasheet. And the datasheet is like a 600 page document that will illustrate how to work on those components. Uh, you only use the first 10 uh, uh, pages as that will describe like where are the pins and what are the, like the, the, uh, the configurations of the chip, what are the voltages, and the rest is just documentation for developers that create fancy badges. Yeah, control F is uh, like really useful uh, because it's a lot of documentation. So uh, UART, uh, it is basically connecting three wires to it. So you have your ground pin to have like a stable reference pin, and you have a pin TX and RX. TX for uh, being transmitting data to a device, and RX for receiving data from a device. So. Uh, if you ever did tin can communication, two tin cans with beans to drill a hole in it, piece of wire uh, between, then uh, someone is talking, the other one is listening, and the other way around. This is how serial communication works. So TX need to be connected to the RX, RX need to be connected to the TX. JTAG is just connecting a device to a uh, JTAG. Uh, interface, which could be the default JTAG, but could also be single wire debug, could also be a serial connection, could it also be UART. So there's different ways of implementing uh, serial, but there's also uh, also a tool like, for instance, UART JTAG or Open OCD or uh, JLink uh, that will allow you to interact with the chips. And it's just dump image, name of the file, a location where to start and how many bytes do you want to extract. Done. And you have a file on your machine. Um, because this is over a wire, it will uh, become more uh, slow than just taking the chip out and put it into a socket. So this could take like two days to extract the, the like a really uh, uh, important piece of data that is hidden somewhere in JTAG uh, uh, string, while I can read the same data like in 10 minutes with a socket. <coughs> so this is like a TPM chip, uh, the data containing the, the key, an attacker eavesdropping on the communication between the main chip. Uh, so it is connecting wires to it, uh, um, uh, adding that to a uh, logic analyzer and being able to record it and uh, analyze it. So this is like the cheapest way to uh, dump a chip. This is a CH341A. Don't buy the black one because it's at a fault. You need the green one. 
uh, because it's like 3.3 volt and 5 volt and this one says it will do 3.3 but still do 5 so you will burn chips so if you <laughs> search for them online search for the green one and this is just a matter of looking at the symbols that are on the chip so what is the brand uh, what is the type specifying this in the software and you will get this fancy hexadecimal overview that will show these are the the details and this is like how a human would conceive it uh yeah already uh, said like uh, voltage glitching but it's also like sometimes uh data is being leaked by emissions for instance and i thought like there's like really really fancy hardware necessary to read the data from a screen this is a, a, a snippet from a defcon uh, thing where a lady carrying a girl's laptop in pink uh, was reading the data that was on the screen by using a software defined radio by using the trick vertical resolution horizontal resolution this vertical times horizontal times the refresh rate search that on a so, uh, uh, rtl sdr look at the waterfall and being able to read the data <laughs> mind blown so uh being able to see someone else's screen while you're not in the room by listening to radio signals i'm insane uh, one of my experiences with uh, side channel is the raspberry pi 2b i'm a really fan uh, of a raspberry pi since i was uh, educating people schools do not have the funds or means to uh, educate kids so if you have like a cheaper way to do that either by obtaining hardware from companies that they no longer use or whatever uh, Raspberry Pi was like something simple you could like share uh, or uh, each have their own uh, micro SD card so people could work on Python programs uh, address hardware do all kind of fancy stuff and uh, the people from Raspberry Pi uh, created uh, uh, create new versions every time so now we are at four uh, they created a really fancy keyboard model uh, for the Pi 400 uh, this uh, was the version 2 and they noticed something was wrong when they shot an image of the uh, device because there was a MOSFET that did not have any uh, coating on the outside so I don't know if you ever like uh, uh, felt the, the top of a metal transistor and if you add light to it, it will react differently. So you can use that to create your own alarm uh, uh, beam. And that's like the same thing. So as soon as the Xeon flashlight went on on this device, it immediately rebooted. And uh, this uh, these are side channel so you could take the uh, the chip off uh, like dremel it like dissolve it in acid uh, uh, add light at uh, uh, emp um, one of my gurus is colin o'flynn colin o'flynn is from new ea and he uh, created the kickstarter uh, called the chip whisperer which is a device that allows you to do differential power analysis on hardware so what you do is you connect to the calculating CPU pin and you measure the voltage or the current. And uh, what you will uh, be note, uh, uh, what you will uh, uh, see is that uh, a multiplication will have a different signature than an addition. So by seeing that the uh, uh, you can uh, discover uh, what calculation uh, uh, is being done. You can obtain cryptographic keys from a device. So if you are able to uh, create 40 
key manipulations, then you will be able to read the key in plain text. If it is, uh, if you have physical access to the device, and you can connect uh, this uh, uh, this to it. I bought this device. I got it last week. This is a uh, chip shouter Pico, which is like the home edition of an EMP gun. Uh, so. Uh, this is a device that will build up a voltage uh, to uh, in uh, to capacitors to uh, 250 volt, and will discharge that over a coil uh, with a ferrite uh, um, stick inside. Sorry, yeah, um, but not the bead. It's the stick. Okay, uh, so you unload it, and uh, what you see is that, like in some places on the sti uh, on the chip, it will like reboot. Like, oh, I don't know what to do. I'll, uh, you know what? I'll start again. But in some places, you're able to induce a fault, and induce a fault as skip an instruction on the chip. So if you have the correct moment in time, if you have the correct position, you will be able to bypass the security. You will be able to glitch the um, uh, the fuse bits to be able to extract the firmware. So you see, a lot of it uh, uh, has been done either by using EMP glitching or by uh, playing with the voltages, like turning a zero into a one by uh, adding voltage to it, or like uh, uh, dropping down from a voltage to a zero by uh, uh, charging a capacitor or whatever. Uh, you will be able to tamper with the software on the hardware. If you're really into fa uh, uh, fancy stuff, watch live overfl uh, overflow. Uh, German guy uh, always says, well, I'm new to this. I have no clue what I'm doing. Liar. Uh, <laughs> he is, it is such a humble, kind uh, guy that is able to explain complex technology in like a really accessible way for people. So. No uh, PewDiePie or T series life. Uh, so whenever you see like the new paper coming out of your printer, it might uh, add a uh, subscribe to uh, Life Overflow uh, to it. So if you are creating hardware, commercial hardware, have your hardware tested, or better, learn how to test it yourself by doing it. So you will be able to validate the report that you see, like if someone tested it, uh, d did they think about everything, if you just see the report and just have to trust someone on their blue eyes, that uh, will be a different one uh, than if you know how to do it yourself. Uh, protocols. So uh, basically it's just a one and a zero, power or no power. Uh, sometimes it uh, adds a clock to it, so you know that two d uh, devices will be able to talk uh, at the same speed. If there's no clock, you have to configure both sides to uh, uh, have the same amount of characters per second being sent. And you see like a lot of different protocols being used. So I already uh, talked about uh, UART, I talked about uh, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, USB. There's a lot of different protocols. The cool thing is, you don't have to know about this. So, if you have a logic analyzer, which is basically a multimeter that measures voltage levels uh, and is able to interpret it into a one or a zero on a timeline, the software will interpret the protocol for you. So you say, well, this is I squared C because I read it like in the documentation or in the data sheet of the device. I configured it, this is the clock, this is the uh, data pin, and it will like show all the data either in hexadecimal or in ASCII like readable text. How does these, uh, this data, uh, How's this data being communicated? So we're like going a little bit deeper. 
it is the thing can communication. Ada Lovelace, so good as for her. Uh, you need to uh, communicate data from uh, TX to RX, RX to TX. So what you see is that uh, to be able to uh, have people communicate with each other, they numbered all the letters and symbols. Uh, so uh, if you have those on the same site, and, uh, whether it be ASCII or EBSDIC or whatever, uh, if you send it from one side, someone on the other side is able to read it. So this is how data is being sent. So uh, data will be stored in a buffer, will be sent, and will be sent over the line in a different order. So it is not, uh, it's going from the back instead of uh, from the front. So it's, uh, uh, it is a little uh, reversed. So imagine having the situation of having a really, really old computer, like a PDP-11, that needs to communicate with a really modern computer, a Windows computer, using PuTTY, which is a client to be able to communicate with each other, then we need to set up the communication. So this is an old computer, so uh, we need to set up the baud rate. Baud rate is number of uh, bits per second, numbers of ones and zeros per second, so it's 1200. So it's basically 120 characters will be sent every second over, over the line. Uh, the number of ones and zeros to describe uh, the uh, letter that you're sending is seven. So it could be eight. In this case, we configured it to be seven. So it depends on what protocol that you use. And we're using EBSIDIC, and EBSIDIC was configured to be seven. Then we have like a number of stop bits, and the stop bits uh, determine this is the end of the character. So, next one, next one, next one. It's like the spaces in between the uh, uh, the words in the sentence. Uh, then there's a parity. So nowadays you see uh, if you download an ISO of uh, a program, the, there's a hash at the end, and you can validate if uh, the thing that you downloaded uh, is correctly. Back then we were still like having issues with sending the uh, initial. Uh, character, uh, characters correctly. So uh, we had a parity, which was a check on one character that we sent over the line. And the last thing is flow control, and flow control is like the flags in Schiphol uh, instructing the air, uh, airplane to stop or continue. So this will uh, say uh, I'm uh, ready to receive receive the data, the data needs to be processed, I finish processing, I'm ready to receive again. So I stop the communication and I start it again to continue. So that's another thing that you see uh, nowadays. In all the modern equipment, it is like 115200, so like way faster. It's eight data bits, it's one stop bit, doesn't use parity and doesn't use flow control. So we're now at a point that uh, hardware is so reliable that we don't need all these security measures that we uh, invented in the past. So at the start of the communication, uh, the uh, voltage is high. So this means if you measure it with a multimeter, it will say 5 volt. As soon as you start communicating, the uh, voltage drops to zero, or close to zero. So this is my uh, start bit. Now I'm uh, uh, transferring the data bits that describe the letter S. And now we have the parity bit that will tell if w all the ones and zeros were uh, uh, communicated correctly. And it's set to even, even main, uh, means it should be zero, so we add a zero to the end, if the numbers of ones is even. So one, two, three, four, that's even, so this should be an, uh, a zero. Uh, if I have more ones, or if this was a, a one, then my other uh, end would say parity error in the, in the communication. So this is like really ancient. So uh, yeah, you have even and odd, is, which is just uh, just a way. But there are some other ones that no one ever used, which is called mark and space. 
and mark and space allow you to always have this one a zero or a one. So why would you add a, a digit or a bit to a string? If I have a device that uh, sends, sorry, sends data seven bits, and I have another device sending it uh, eight bits, I need to convert it. What if I send a space parity, then I add a zero to the end, but the data is reversed, so it's prefixed with a zero. So the other end will receive eight, uh, uh, eight bits. So you don't need any fancy protocol converters, and you will still be able to communicate a seven bits device to an eight bits device. Just a trick that you can, uh, can use. Then there's a number of stop bits, which can be one, two, or 1.5. But why 1.5? One, 1 Actually, the, uh, this could be 1.2435687 for all I care, because the amount of time that it is in stop doesn't matter. It only stops when it's being pulled low. So that will be the instruction. Now uh, we will see the next character uh, being uh, sent. Usually this will be one. There are some protocols like DMX that are so fast that they need some more time in between the, the communication that we use uh, to stop it. And then we'll be low and stop again. So sometimes you see this is RX. Oh, this is also RX, so we connect them. That doesn't work. So that's like common problems that you run into. Or people that put like markings on their PCB saying RX, meaning you have to connect the RX to it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is sending the data. So if you look at the same uh, DB9 pin, uh, this was from an error that we communicated with modems. Modulator, they were modulator, a device that is able to uh, turn ones and zeros into sound and to so turn sounds into ones and zeros. So if you look at those pins, you will see the ground pin, you will say, see the uh, TX and the RX being transmitted and uh, received, but there's also some other pins. And I already said, told like the flags with the airplanes, uh, Request to send, connected to clear to set on the other side, clear to send to request to send, data set ready to data terminal ready, data terminal ready to data set ready. HSMs will still use this. What is an HSM? Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, hardware security um, uh, module that's usually a large device. I don't know if you've seen war games where uh, two people have to like turn two keys. That's uh, basically a way to create cryptographic secrets in a way uh, that is, is totally secure. Uh, so you will be able to uh, have secure uh, uh, payment transactions. So uh, they will be used in a special device. And uh, this device is sealed. There's no screws if you... Uh, 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 hit on the floor, they will wipe themselves. It's like uh, you could do the same thing with a Raspberry Pi. Uh, this will cost you like 50,000 euros, 100,000 euros to do it to uh, prove that it is secure. And uh, doing that is something that not one person do, does, but it's usually multiple people, either three or five or seven people, attending such a uh, ceremony, that, like uh, key guardians that uh, have oversight of the entire procedure and they're typing in long strings of hexadecimal code to make sure that a new certificate is enrolled to use a new device or uh, whatever. Uh, so this is like the hardware handshaking. Uh, there's also another way of uh, handshaking. So we have DSR, DTR, RTS, CTS, but there's also Exxon, XOF. So Exxon, XOF is a character in the ASCII alphabet. So that's uh, character 19 and 17, being Ctrl S and Ctrl Q, that uh, are a software way of uh, 
halting, pausing the serial communication. So on those old terminals, you had like a pause key that would like stop the other side. And that's by, uh, by sending those characters. Um, if you communicate with two devices, then they need to be configured in the same way if you're not using a clock. So both need to be configured for the same baud rate. So um, if my device communicates on a specific baud rate and I connect a device to read it, then I'm only able to read it if it is the same speed. It's like people in Arabic talking to people in Greece. Uh, they need to have like the same protocol, they need to have the same uh, uh, speed to be able to understand each other. So, how do people come up with these numbers, like 9600, 4800, uh, 300, 1200? Inside a computer is a uh, crystal that uh, creates a pulse, and that crystal runs on 1.8432 megahertz. And that uh, frequency does not ring a bell. But if you divide this by the number of two, you will hear uh, numbers that do ring a bell. Like 115200, 57K6, 36K8, 14K4, 1200, those were the numbers that you would read on the box of a modem that would allow you to connect to the internet. So it is based on this crystal and the divider, like dividing it in one or two or three or 16 or whatever, will come up with uh, this stuff. So the older the device, the lower the frequency. So one of my first modems was an acoustic modem had like two rubber rings and you need to like put in uh, the, uh, the, the uh, part of the, the telephone. Uh, so the speaker uh, to the microphone and the microphone to the speaker. And uh, you would like connect to the device like ATDT, have a specific number and she like connected. And then you could like download software. And my wife's entire salary went up on the phone bill. <laughs> and when she came home from work and said, Goedemiddag! It was like, no carrier. And I had to uh, uh, run it uh, over for uh, another three hours. So this is not an issue we have uh, anymore by having uh, fast internet connections, but that's like ancient history. So if you're, you have a device that is sending the data on 115K speeds of 115200, and these are like the start and stop bits and the bits that, being, uh, that are being sent, and you're reading it like double the, the size, you will not be able to read it. So if these speeds or protocol uh, agreements do not match, you will see this kind of data. And chances are high that within this gibberish, you will have like a control S or a control Q. So if you have configured your putty or your client to have uh, software flow control, like some off, and you have like some random data on your screen, you think my device is secure because I'm not able to connect with it. Well, in fact, you are on pause by sending out a gibberish. So if we look at hardware, so we uh, had like the overview, the devices, the issues with the hardware, the protocols, the ones and the zeros. But if we look at the hardware itself, uh, you see like a green uh, circuit board, could be white, purple, pink, whatever. So it used to be green, but there's like more possibilities nowadays. And you will see like a number of components. I can help you identify each and every one of them, but most of them are analog. And I don't care about analog yet. Yet. <laughs> yet, yeah, I think about them like radio stuff. Um, so we need to 
care about the stuff that will contain our crown jewels. So if you look at components here, I can just name a few. This is capacitor, this is an inductor, this is probably a MOSFET, this is also a capacitor, this is an LED. Uh, these are like the opto couplers. The, they don't mind. So what, what, uh, there's like a couple of things. So there's like chips with eight pins that usually have an indicator 24 or 25 that usually have a type number that is to the power of two, like 64, 256, 1024. Those are usually EPROMs. <coughs> so they will store a little bit of memory uh, that will uh, hold like the USB ID or like a serial number or like a key or like password or like whatever. So this is like small amounts of data. Then there's like the square ones. Uh, those are microcontrollers, microcomputers, FPGAs, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, ZigBee, Z-Wave, whatever. It is a collection of components housed in just one package that will probably also have the EEPROM, also have uh, 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 flash memory, but this could be like protected with uh, 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 fuse switch. So if I take this chip off and I just put it into a socket in the computer, like uh, 30 seconds later, I will see what's on the chip. This, I need to find the correct uh, adapter. I need to find the correct voltage. I might need to like level the voltages to the level of the, the, the chip. I might need to glitch. I might need to do power analysis. This is way harder than doing this. And usually when being able to look at the secrets, the chip, the serial number, the password in this chip, I'm already halfway there. And there are some other chips, like rectangular chips. And you have the rectangular chips with the pins on the long side. Uh, the pins on the long side are the chips uh, that are ROM memory. So what they all always uh, told me, if you take off the power, all the data is gone. They could not be more wrong. Because the data will still be there for another two minutes before the decays. So if you have a device that uh, was used for a bit longer, uh, you will be able to read the data from this chip, as it will not be only on one place, but all over the place. Uh, and you will be able to read it from the raw memory. But maybe two minutes is not enough, because you need to like open the cover, uh, remove the, 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 uh, the power, add like a clip on to the, the chip. If you use a, a freezing spray, or uh, you use like a dust spray from the action for three euros, and you hold it upside down, you will freeze the chip and add another 10 minutes extra time. So uh, there is a Finnish company that did a proof concept on hacking laptops with BitLocker by having a separate, uh, so the, the laptop was secure, uh, was in hibernation mode, the BIOS was protected. So what I did is, what I did is take another laptop, remove all the, pro uh, uh, the protection, cloned the BIOS settings, flashed that on the other one that was protected, so it was no longer protected anymore, freezed the, the uh, chips, were able to boot from a Linux uh, uh, chip, uh, being able to read the memory, and retrieve the BitLocker key, mount the partition using the BitLocker key, and uh, read the data from the disk using an Arduino Uno. <laughs> so uh, when I host hardware hacking training, uh, I can do it with like uh, uh, half a million on equipment, but I like to host my hardware training with stuff that I can find on the street. Because if you know how to read the data with an Arduino, then you will definitely know how to read it with this DRM protected uh, uh, special widget that you can buy from 
where, if I'm correct, this uh, this trick also works. Like this is flash memory. Uh, the RAM in your computer also has the same thing. So in theory, yeah. you could also do that with the RAM in someone's computer and read that out. Yeah. So um, then there's this same rectangular chips with pins on the short side. Uh, that's flash memory. And flash memory is um, the stuff that you will find in an SD card. The stuff that you will find in a USB stick. The stuff that you will find in an SSD hard drive. So if you image that, you will have like a disk with partitions, with file systems, with data. So I can dump the data, put it on my machine, mount it with loop, and connect to it and run all my Linux tools on it, because I'm just like in a Linux tool, only more uh, less secure. So it's not encrypted, it's not using like fancy hashing algorith uh, algorithms to protect it, there's no salting on the, the security. Uh, yeah, you will be able to read everything. And what you're doing now, is instead of like attacking a router from the outside by trying to brute force all the username and password combinations, you're actually looking at a list of passwords or you're looking at the scripts that are running to host this device. So feels a little bit like cheating, but it does the job. So this is more fancy to do it, but usually taking this chip off, taking this chip off already uh, bones like 75% uh, of data. My worst enemy when I do uh, when I'm doing hardware hacking is time. So uh, time, as in the amount of hours that a customer is willing to pay for me doing this job, I can play with that because if I have like this special assignment and I'm only granted doing. Uh, four hours on it, or like four weeks on it, or like four months on it, and I'm nearly there and I want to back down so desperately, I continue working on the weekend. Because I want to beat the game. To the very big annoyance of my mother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are some uh, backsides to that. Uh, then there's uh, like backend connectivity. Uh, because like this device is connected to an API and uh, they will only let it run for two weeks. Yeah, I cannot do anything about it. Uh, then there's this thing where I get the device, open it up and find out that this specific socket that I need to read the chip is not in my position. So I have to order it. It is Chinese New Year, yeah. <laughs> and it's Corona. So, yeah, then I can like solder tiny magnet wires to the chip and like have a tedious uh, day of work. So it would be better if I already have the device, but asking a client to say, hey, can you already open the device? Take out the PCB and, oh yeah, uh, by the way, before doing that, take pictures of everything, see how, I, how you open it. Because here's like any protective uh, things, if uh, it's like some uh, stuff that will allow you to see that I open this device, they're not going to do that. They, this is my, your job, Gilles, you do this. So what I do is if a device contains radio frequency, it needs to be regulated. It needs to be regulated by the FCC, especially for the uh, American market. So on all devices, even on your iPhone, you can find an FCC ID. And this is fine. Um, if you go to FCC.io and you type in this number, you will end up in a directory that contains the PDF of the user manual of the device. Hmm an image of the outside of the device, an image of all the circuit boards that are in the device, a setup in a cage of Faraday to test the emission of the device. Like, we 
we have Christmas early this year. So uh, at one time I was by uh, dropping by my mother-in-law in the hospital. And at some point in time, you're finished talking. So she was connected to all kinds of hardware. Can you move it a little bit so I can take a picture of the bottom. And uh, I think within 10 minutes, I know that this device was like, connected via radio. It was 868 uh, megahertz. It was like, uh, <laughs> I knew more than I should. So uh, this is really helpful for getting the advantage because I know that these are SMD uh, uh, chips. This is um, uh, not SMD, but uh, I don't see any BGA chips here. So I have all the stuff that I need for opening this up. This is, by the way, the Lego uh, uh, EV3 brick from uh, who also is uh, connected to Lego and will be able to uh, be searched. Uh, sometimes there's companies that redact this, so uh, people are allowed to shield it from uh, the public. Uh, I think there's only one case where I noticed that I uh, shielded it up. Uh, this is the uh, data sheet, so 357 pages, but this contains, here's the JTAG, here's the UART. This will work from 1.62 to 3.6 volt. Uh, there must be some temperature stuff in here as well. Like all these prerequisites for this chip to work are defined in this menu. And you can play by it by just taking off the os uh, 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 oscillator, the, 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 uh, the crystal and adding your own pulse generator. And people were able to take a simple Wi-Fi module, an uh, ESP8266, drop the, uh, the processor uh, pulses to be able to, uh, to be able to decode uh, 868 megahertz instead of 2.4 gigahertz by just yeah step by step by step by step dropping uh, the number of ticks per uh, per second. You missed the phone. Oh. Okay. Uh, so here you see the uh, the chips uh, that I already talked about, and I already have a physical one because I think you should feel it. And uh, I took this from a live drive, so this is an, a compact uh, flash uh, device. Uh, however, there's a little hard disk inside. So this is not memory, this is like physical uh, hard drive. Yeah. So you can pass this around. So uh, this even uh, uh, um, uh, adds an EE prompt to it, and an, uh, no, an E prompt to it. And uh, E prompt is elect uh, erasable programmable read-only memory. So this device can be programmed uh, using electricity, but it needs to be wiped in ultraviolet light. So what you see is there's like a glass window, and if you put it like uh, in an ultraviolet uh, device for I think it was eight minutes, then it will entirely wipe it and you're able to override it again. So you will find these in uh, traffic light uh, uh, systems not as much in the current ones, because we now have EEPROM, and uh, that uh, allows you to erase it electrically and not erase it via ultraviolet light. So instead of having an engineer coming over to upgrade your modem by uh, replacing a chip, you can just do, uh, do it over the air. And here you see like the logic, the ROM with the pins on the long side, and the flash with the pins on the short side. So when you're searching for signals, uh, your printed circuit board is already a spoiler. So what you see here is like the entire uh, light green uh, face 
is connected to one of these pins. So th this is like a plus connecting everything to the entire ground plate. So all these pins are ground. So whenever I see uh, a pin connecting to the entire surface of the device, then I know it, it is a ground. I see pins here that are small, small lanes. So uh, it's like the dark green is separating the light green from the other light green stuff. And the small lanes are data lanes. While the thicker lanes, like these, are the voltage lanes. And here you see like plus 5 volt ground, uh, TX, RX, so it's already spoiled here. But just by looking at the, uh, the layout of the print uh, uh, PCB, you're already seeing like uh, this is ground. So if I have ground, I can connect to any of the thin lane uh, connections to be able to read what data I'll see. So uh, I need a volunteer. And I need someone that uh, feels the least confidence about doing this. An absolute beginner, someone that never done this before. Everyone is experienced. I really like that. OK, cool. Uh, so what we are going to do now is uh, collaborate. So we work together, so you don't have to do it all by yourself. But we are going to um, find, we are going to be Nemo. Nemo in the underground seeing the matrix. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to do this with only 10 euros of hardware. So what we're going to do first is determine the ground pin. So we could do that like visually by seeing if it's like connected to the entire uh, surface. But we could also do that by looking, uh, measuring the connectivity between certain points on the device uh, and see if it beeps. And I call this myself the Wi-Fi setting of a multimeter because it has like these Wi-Fi waves uh, uh, next to it. And whenever we found ground, then the next step is seeing what the voltages are of the signals. So it could be like a, a zero, which means like uh, zero volt or uh, zero is being transmitted could be and that's depending on the hardware that we use 3.3 volt 5 volt or could like fluctuate and when it's fluctuating it is not a steady one but it's like one zero zero one zero so it's actually transmitting data so whenever we see fluctuating data on the multimeter we actually see data So, uh, once more, voltage explained. You need to have a reference pin to determine the voltage, because voltage is potential difference between two points. So, if I take the molex of a, uh, uh, a power uh, system of a PC, then I can uh, connect the 12 volt fan to it by connecting the black cable to the black and the red cable to the yellow. It will spin at full power on 12 volt. I could also connect it to, to the red pin. So the black to the black and the red to the red. Then it will be 5 volt. But I can also connect it to the yellow and the uh, red pin. And then it will be the difference between 12 volt and 5 volt being 7. So this is fast lot of noise this is silent but not a not, uh, not a lot of airflow and this was like a trick to have like an in-between solution for uh, uh, letting your airflow uh, run so this is the Wi-Fi setting of your multimeter and it uh, will allow it to beep Jure, can you show how it beeps and uh, we're going to do it now but we have a challenge for you where you can all uh, experience it yourself using virtual hardware, using the same, oh, can you? Yeah. Be, uh, 
uh, able to uh, determine if two parts are connected. Uh, because different components use different voltages, so it's like uh, they work either on 5 volt, or they work on 5 volt and 3.3 volt, or only on 3.3 volt. So we need to measure the voltage. So whenever we determined the uh, ground, we can determine the voltage. And then when we see it fluctuating, this is where we, uh, where we go to. Uh, another way to do this is by connecting a logic al analyzer and have it interpret it for you. So we need to switch to this camera. Are you able to switch this to? Okay. Uh, can we swap the HDMI? Okay. Or we need to have like a circle, but it will be quite a large circle. Uh, let, let me finish the presentation then. That, that's maybe easier. Yeah, yeah so, sorry about that. <laughs> I thought it was, uh, would be faster. Yeah, that's five more slides. Be that's five more slides, yeah. Uh, so, uh, Yilis, uh, stop spending my money. If you Google for Git hardware hacking toolbox, you will find a PDF, 600 pages, that will contain uh, every Mission Impossible style gadget that will have like a small USB hub that is like one centimeter big or like uh, stuff to check where you are being spied upon or like really, really tiny computers or uh, it's Yadox666 is the, the, uh, the GitHub. And this is how it, uh, how it looks, the hardware hacking uh, toolkit. So Git hardware hacking toolkit and uh, we'll uh, uh, take you there. If you want to do this yourself, um, it is nice to have someone that helps you. I will not come to your house. So uh, alternatively, uh, you can uh, take a piece of hardware that is listed in openwrt.org. And openwrt.org is an open source firmware for routers. And these are hardware hackers that made sure that they're closed source uh, device is being broken open to allow this hardware to do. So while it is aimed at installing open source software, it also shows what pins to connect to for UART, for JTAG, for whatever. So if you go to the thrift shore, uh, shop uh, or to flea markets, uh, like this stack, we paid one euro for every device and just take it apart and it doesn't matter if it breaks because it's only one euro. Take it apart, you learn from it, you can take the chips out, uh, uh, whatever. But this will include like all the different components here and uh, how to uh, work on that. So uh, this could be your shopping list for, your, uh, for the thrift shop. Uh, maybe you wanna take a picture of uh, this one. Uh, yeah, it's going to hold it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this includes all uh, the components. Like these are the like the, the uh, Chinese knockoffs, and this is like stuff you find on the streets. So this is not like a Salea logic, a logic analyzer, not a fluke uh, uh, thing. But you will still be able to uh, to do this. Uh, so you have a multimeter that has a zoomer, like the Wi-Fi setting. Uh, you have banana to uh, crocodile uh, to allow uh, uh, Dupont cables, these ones, to be uh, connected to the, the pin headers. There's an FTDI that allows you to read the serial communication, like the, the, the console information of a device. There's a logic analyzer that allows you to eavesdrop on uh, different communication uh, parts and eavesdrops on uh, serial communication. There's uh, the SD link that allows you to do uh, JTAG, uh, some clip-ons, and this will allow you to uh, read the data from SPI and I2C EEPROM chips. EEPROM chips. 
So, uh, don't know if you're aware of this. There might be a couple of tickets left. This is Woodstock for Hackers. It's like a really epic, it's in Zeewolde. It is from 22 to 26. And uh, Jure and I will do two talks and Jure and Jelle will do a talk as well. Um, take a picture of this because you need, need this if you want to participate in the CTF. You cannot win anything, but just have a lot of fun. So the website is https colon slash slash portal dot hackathon dot org. And this is like the Deloitte uh, uh, CTF environment. So if you ever did another uh, uh, CTF, uh, you will be able to uh, uh, collect the same points. Um, the invite code that you need to join is uh, Tuckerlab2022. Uh, that will enable the hardware hacking challenges. So we have a Canbus challenge where you need to analyze the uh, Canbus connections to see uh, when Elon uh, opened the door of his Tesla. Um, and there's a hardware hacking uh, device uh, for reading UART. And there's one that's more complex for reading UART, I squared C, and JTAG using uh, virtual hardware. Uh, this will be open until uh, tomorrow night. So uh, if you need more time, you will be able to uh, do so. If you are on Twitter, you can reach out to me uh, for hints or uh, whatever. Sorry? Or, me. or to Jure, Jure Jelle at... Uh, uh, so um, there's one thing that you want to note uh, also. Sometimes devices use default credentials. And there's a website called cirt.net, C-I-R-T.net slash passwords. And they will contain uh, the passwords just like if you're using uh, Kali, uh, you are probably familiar with Rockyou, uh, a password list. But this is like a website that contains like default passwords if you want to uh, uh, connect to it. Yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, that concludes my TED talk. <laughs>